Okay, so we have some time for questions and discussion and to engage our panel, and there are microphones that are placed in key locations, and I'm going to start on, oh, and yes, um, please come forward, Dr. Leduc, sorry. Um, so I, w I wanted to start with a question, and I'm kind of an inspired by a couple of the presentations, and what it has to do with is for the purposes of working on um, issues like personal protective equipment, disinfection, waste, um, waste disposal, um, has any thought been given to what is an appropriate surrogate for the Ebola virus in terms of its behavior, its survival under various conditions? Yeah, that does not require uh, BSL-4 uh, laboratory um, facilities in order, in order to, um, to, do, to run experiments. Do people have any ideas of, of, of about that? Uh, Dr. Peters? Yeah. Uh, there's a species of Ebola called Restin, which is thought not to be pathogenic for humans and could be downgraded from four. In addition to that, uh, Heinz Feldman and some of his colleagues have produced a, uh, an Ebola virus by genetic engineering that lacks the genes to ward off interferon, which Ebola has in quantity. And that's probably not pathogenic, although I can't imagine any institutional review board giving you permission to use it. Other ideas about that? There are various pseudotype viruses that could potentially be used. Um, you, you do always get into the, the question of, of you, you do those experiments and then say, yeah, but is that really, does it react, uh, act the same way as the real virus? But that would be another idea. Um, from the point of view of doing studies for PPE, um, we would like a surrogate that fluoresces. <laughs> Yeah, it occurs to me for PPE that um, some of the surrogates that EPA is using with waste, which are bacteria, would just not be appropriate at all, right, in terms of size and, and other, um, other characteristics. Go ahead. Well, um, part of the problem is the surrogate needs to be selected for the type of experiments you want to do. If you want to look at persistence on environmental matrices, you may look at one surrogate. If you want to look at how it interacts with bleach, you might look at a totally different surrogate. If you want to look at thermal incineration, you might look at a different one. It's, it's a, doing, selecting the right surrogate is difficult and it's not gonna be one, one bug fits all. Could I? Yes. Um, just to follow up on that, as Dr. Howard pointed out, having some surrogate, and as, as Mr. Lemieux pointed out, testing the cleaning of an elastomeric air purifying you know, rubber half mask is very different from thinking about a uh, Tyvek hood and the question of what you're trying to do with PPE testing. Are you trying to protect, um, evaluate whether the filtration effectiveness works or whether somebody who is doffing PPE contaminates their skin is a very different question. So thinking through what question you're asking requires defining what you want in a surrogate. Yes, Dr. Peters. You know, there are commercially available fluorescent pa uh, powders that are not visible to the eye until they're hit with UV light. And it seems to me like that would be a very valuable adjunct to training people uh, in doffing their gear if they put on their gear and then had this powder applied and then they were fluoresced after they got their gear off. You could see where some of the breaks might occur. Thank you for that. We have the first uh, question at the mic. Uh, if you could please identify yourself. Um, and um, right. yeah, the mic is a little bit high, isn't it? It's <laughs> all right. I think it's, it's fine. Thank you. Um, I'm Peg Seminario. I'm the Safety and Health Director for the FLCIO, and thanks to everybody for, for being here and your great presentations. Um, the, the last presentation just really brought it all home in terms of the crisis that's being faced, and I think one of the things that's really 
important as we're thinking about research in the same way that we're thinking about how we're going to stop the virus, we have to look at Africa, that we have to actually look first and foremost at Africa for what are the research needs as well. And one area that would be very helpful, I think, for us to focus on, 527 healthcare workers who have gotten sick and the uh, 250 who have died. Do we have any more information on those workers, who they were, what their occupations were, what the potential exposures, because it does seem that that's going to be at the heart of the response and the heart of protecting those people, that finding out as much as we can about the exposures, and also, as Michael Hodgson said, go to the frontline workers in Africa and find out what do they need? What do they think the questions are that have to be answered for them to be able to do their jobs would be really critical as we're going forward to some of the immediate needs that we need to identify. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, th great, great question. Um, so looking at this, we, we tried to investigate it as uh, intensively as we can in healthcare worker infections. And in my time in Africa, when we've had healthcare workers, I've gone to those people, as awkward as it is, you know, while they're in the ward and say, okay, what happened? Do you have, do you can identify anything? It's extremely rare that there's a discrete event that someone can say, okay, I had a needle stick or I had blood splash in my eye. So most times people really have no idea where they got infected. They can say, oh, there's one small irregularity that happened here or there. There was one case, for example, where a guy got all dressed up in his PPE, went into the ward, and then had to go to the bathroom pretty precipitously. And so he, he didn't recognize any real breach in protocol, but nevertheless, he, he recognized that he kind of did things very rapidly. But so we, we don't have an easy answer to that. Uh, again, very few people have something very discreet. We focus on the doffing part of this as it's probably the most difficult, although there's certainly the potential for infection and, and other uh, other parts of the, the whole process in the ward. There are also, even though it seems very illogical to us and, and hard to believe, a lot of these healthcare workers actually do still do health um, deliver care on a private basis at their homes and other places. So there's the potential for infection that's totally unrelated to the ward. And some of them are in recognized chains of transmission elsewhere. So um, we, I don't think we are going to have, through existing data, conclusive evidence for that. Thank you. And next question. Thank you. Thank you. L Lieutenant Marcy Wright, USPHS uh, Asper. Uh, two questions, first for Dr. Lemio and then for Dr. Peters. Dr. Lemio, I appreciate your comments regarding the need for uh, what I consider applied biosafety research for waste decontamination systems, including EDS, tissue digesters, and others. Um, but how do you um, develop the risk assessment justification and um, explanation to the lay public on some of the technical nuances that we have in sterilization as 10 to the 6 log reduction versus decontamination, reducing to an acceptable level, um, et cetera, as um, folks grapple with the fears of, of how well incinerators incinerate a lipid enveloped virus, for example. Uh, and then to follow on, Dr. Peters, um, what val um, how well developed are many genome systems and virus-like particle systems or other systems or using REST and Ebola as a model um, in terms of pulling that work out of the biosafety level four containment into biosafety level two, including, say, the use of VLPs for, for some of the experiments Dr. Lemio described? Uh, well, um I think the whole issue of, of risk communication, I didn't have it on my slide, but I should have. I mean, it's, it's a huge uh, gap, I think, across the whole spectrum of, of everything. Um, and especially on the, on the waste management side, they've had to grapple with, with risk communication for years and years. I don't know that there's a magic bullet for that. It, um, but I think there's a definite, uh, a definite need for us to be able to improve how how we can take these scientific nuances and explain them to um, the you know the, not just the general public but th this is largely an interdisciplinary effort now that we're looking at it and 
you may have the jargon from one group of, of scientific experts who don't understand the jargon from another group of scientific experts. It goes way beyond just talking to the public. Can't agree more with that, actually. Uh, Dr. Peters? I guess VLPs, or virus-like particles, are can be made with Ebola and look like Ebola, and they're the same size as Ebola. So they would be a possibility, but they're not, uh, at this time, they're not economically feasible. I would, uh, I don't know what it would cost to really scale up. In terms of risk communication, I've, well, first of all, the public understands about as much about microbiology as they do about integral calculus. They're not, they can add well, but I wouldn't go much beyond that. So what I've usually done is picked out two or three reporters who seem to be interested and more intelligent than average and have some background and spent my time educating them and trying to uh, use them as a mouthpiece and trusted their abilities to, to translate what I say into real, real speech. I should say there's several reporters in the room, all of whom are above average, so I just <laughs> want to make that clear. Um, um, other comments? I, I, I wanted to ask Dr. Leduc. So if, if, if this is a, a, a webinar that's going out to 700 people, let's say you were on one of the major news shows tonight, and you had to explain, in terms of this risk communication challenge that we all have, <clears throat> the differences between uh, the 21-day incubation period and a graph that says 42 days. How would you explain that to the general public? <laughs> it's not a fair question. <laughs> um, well, I, I think the data that I showed, especially that curve, pretty clearly demonstrates that uh, we can identify the vast majority, but not all cases within 21 days. So when we're talking about declaring a country free of disease, then twice that, 42 days, is the criteria that WHO has used. And I think intuitively you can run the graph out there and you can see that there are no new cases out at the, the far end. So it, it seems to me that that's, uh, uh, that additional safety precaution is, is clear. <laughs> no. Obviously Thank you. not. One more response, yes. So what would you say to that second little hump? When you looked at your very nice geometric distribution, around about 14 days, it looks like there was a small second peak. And I wonder if an alert reporter were to ask you, does that suggest that the time point one should be later, and therefore the true doubling is to take care of unexpected, unrecognized second outbreaks, or is it really the, the doubling of the, you know? That's a good observation. And uh, I think you need to uh, just keep in mind that this is real, uh, real data from the field, and the, uh, the accuracy of the observations you know, you don't always know exactly when you were exposed, just as Dan was saying with the clinicians that became infected themselves. Uh, so I, I think there's going to be inherently, using real data, some variability and some assumptions that, uh, that we just have to take into account. Thank you. Next question. Hi. Uh, good morning. Aubrey Miller, NIEHS. Mm -hmm. Um, Dr. Ledoux um, actually started to present some of Dr. Bausch's work, and I'd, one, I hope Dan could comment a little further about what he did and was able to accomplish in, in the sampling, both in terms of uh, human specimens and in terms of uh, fomites and in the environment. And a little bit, um, a little bit more for the group is you know, what's the research concerning some of the understanding of viability in various fluids beyond. I, I've seen some evidence saying a sam blood sample may have it viable for up to 30 days, et cetera. And um, some comment about aerosols, if there's any uh, information regarding aerosols. Thank you. Okay, ju just that. Um, 
So, so th that study that we did in, uh, in Gulu, um, after things calmed down a little bit and we were able to kind of get patient care and, and public health response in reasonable order, we just went around and took, it was convenient sample, so it, whatever sample we could get from a patient. Uh, that was illustrative. I think the conclusions from that were that basically the virus is where we thought that we would be from very sick people. So and when somebody was really sick, that we could get it out of n numerous different fluids. Um, semen, of course, is one that we know that where the virus persistence is there for a couple months, two or three months afterwards. Um, breast milk, I think the latest that we found it uh, viable virus was eight days after um, uh, onset of illness. So. It may be longer. We didn't necessarily have the, the fluids from people at, at every time point. An experiment that, that desperately needs to be done is a similar thing, but much more prospective. And so, you know, this we were just taking samples where we could on, on the fly. We really need to get in there into an isolation ward and say, let's take samples from blood, urine, sweat, vomitus, every sample that we can really from day one and then every day or every other day and really look at the, uh, the excretion of this virus along the, the, those lines. And so that, that's it's not technically particularly complicated. We can do it. We just need to, you know, set up to, to get that done, and that would be very illustrative. You know, what we have now, for example, um, much has been made about virus in sweat, the, but the only two studies that I know of where the virus has been found in sweat was one, we found it in sweat of a, a very sick patient with Ebola, and then Sharif Saki's post-mortem studies and found it in sweat glands. But of course, those were really sick people, and the inappropriate extrapolation is often made that since we can find it in sweat in those people who died of Ebola, that you know the sweats on the bowling ball or on the on the the chair in the in the subway in New York or whatever it is, which is you know not necessarily true. Um, on the environmental side, it may not be completely illustrative because that was a very clean ward when we did it, so things were under control. I think if we'd done taken some environmental samples, perhaps in the very unclean wards, you know, worst case scenarios that I showed, that we might find more virus around. But that's just kind of stands to reason. Aerosol, much has been made about aerosol. Um, you know, it, it's hard to, it, it kind of, it just depends upon how you view the data. It's, I think, very clear that most people get infected from direct contact with blood and bodily fluids, but then in any study you're going to have 15% of the people or some small percentage who say, no, I didn't have that sort of direct contact. Some people say those are the 15% who had aerosol spread or aer aerosol transmission. Others are going to say, well, those, they just didn't recognize their direct contact with blood and bodily fluids. And, you know, I can say one thing, other people can say another thing, but um, if we say, okay, well, show me the data to back up your opinion, they're just not there, which is, of course, why we're all here. Thank you. One more co comment on that. So 20% of the recent New England Journal paper patients coughed, and one of the studies in the 90s similarly showed about 20% of Ebola patients coughed. There is at least one case report of a likely airborne transmission, and one of the lessons from SARS was that of super spreaders, and we still don't know whether it's the geometry of the airway tract or the liquidity of breathing across membranes that actually generates aerosols. So it's not that there isn't a reasonable scientific hypothesis to be asked. It's, you know, the, it's a reasonable question and warrants protection. And I, I wanted to follow up that point that Dr. Hodgson made with Dr. Leduc. You know, you sort of dropped this interesting uh, concept of these many uh, transmissions that have occurred with 14,000 patients and the, the viral behavior. It, I, I thought you intimated that the viral behavior in terms of transmission may have changed. Did I misinterpret you? No. Uh, my point was that we don't know. We don't have any data. I, I, we do know that this virus has been in human-to-human -human transmission for a very long time, longer than has ever occurred in any previous known outbreak. We do know that RNA viruses adapt to their hosts. Uh, th those are, are scientific facts. We don't have the detailed observations that would allow us to associate any genetic change that may or may not have happened because, number one, we don't have current uh, genetic information on the viruses themselves, and, and number two, we don't have the detailed epidemiological uh, background to put uh, observations in the real world with the molecular analysis of the strain. So I think we just don't know. 
Okay, I'm going to move to the next question. Hi, uh, May Chu. I'm from the Office of Science and Technology Policy, and listening to what your all the comments about specimens and about the availability of material to look at these important research questions, I'm asking the panel who might be able to facilitate sharing of specimens and access to virus samples so that the world can make use of this material for research to inform the governments of Syria, Syria Sierra Leone, um, Guinea, and Liberia to develop better clinical management uh, practices and research. Does anybody know how um, the answer to that? How that's been done? Um, the material. Oh, if there isn't. Should we be creating, thinking about creating one? Dr. Leduc, do you have a? <laughs> well, I thought so. Uh, yeah. um, I, I go back to the analogous uh, analogies with the SARS outbreak, and at that time, uh, both CDC and WHO. Uh, led a very aggressive effort to make sure that the virus was available to uh, the international scientific community for analysis, and that uh, that went very well. I know I was at CDC then, and Dr. Kaizak spent a lot of time packing up uh, strains of, of SARS to share with, with others, so uh, that, that worked very well. I don't know what the problems are now, but I suspect that it starts with the countries who have uh, ownership of, of the material, but it, it's more complex than that, and I really don't have any, any answers. Okay, I'm going to move to the next question. Donna Gallagher, UMass Medical School. Uh, thank you all for your work and your presentations. I wanted to um, also thank Dr. Bausch for bringing us back to the reality uh, of the fact that it's in West Africa and the bulk of the diseases in West Africa. I've spent a good part back and forth for seven years in Liberia, and I can tell you that uh, about 10 of our health team members um, died of Ebola because of lack of personal protective equipment. Not because they didn't don it or doff it or do anything with it, they didn't have it. And so one of my concerns in listening this morning is that we have had a few cases in the United States, and at this point, every hospital in the United States has bought personal protection equipment that they probably will never need, um, which has made the pipeline to West Africa dry up. We're about to send several teams to work on Ebola in Liberia, and we're having trouble finding enough personal protective equipment to get there. So. I, I want to just add that to our discussion because we do need to think about where we really need this equipment and make sure it gets there. Um, the second thing I was thinking about is uh, all of this information is wonderful research, and I wonder how it will translate to places like uh, Dr. Bausch showed you and places that I've spent time in where we're lucky we can get bleach sometimes. So if we could translate how we could um, safely dispose of waste, equipment, bodies um, on a much more simplified level because it's unlikely that we're going to have a lot of incinerators or a lot of autoclaves in the next five or six years cropping up in places like Liberia and I'm sure in Guinea and Sierra Leone it's the same thing. So uh, I'd be interested to hear how you think we can rapidly, because it's urgent, translate some of the information that you have so eloquently presented in, in an immediate way to the countries that are suffering right now. So just a, re a reminder that today's workshop, we really are focused on the situation in the U.S., but I think you raise an important point, which is the impact of preparedness efforts in the U.S. on the global supply chains for personal protective equipment and other things, and so I'm wondering if there's any comment on that. Uh, I don't think that we can delve into how should we be controlling the outbreak um, in Afri Africa because we really haven't been composed uh, to do that. But John. Well, first of all, thank you for all of your work in Liberia. Um, and, and I think the point that you're raising, it, to me, is the relationship uh, between the U.S. and West Africa in terms of the global supply chain of supplies. If you have every hospital in the United States prepared to take care of Ebola patients, 
You're exactly right. It, the supply chain is going to dry up where you actually need it. So that's one of the logistical issues that I think this workshop needs to discuss. How can we make sure that the PPE protection for U.S. healthcare workers is proportionate to, one, the prevalence, the incidence, and the requirements, and we don't choke off this global supply chain to other countries that are really in great need, as you point out. I think that logistical question is as important a research question as some of these other other vir virological issues that we're discussing. Thanks. Maybe yes, just Stan. one more comment. Yeah, I, I think uh, I understand that we are trying to focus on the U.S., but it is definitely true that there's no way to not bring this back to West Africa. That's our only choice, regardless of whether you're interested primarily in, in American health or West African health. So, so that point is thank you for making that. Um, and, and it's very difficult to just find in all public health the sweet spot, if you will, of preparation without, without panic and, we're, and, and without um, people going overboard. And so you now you're hearing on the radio that every hospital in the United States has to have their own you know, tr Ebola treatment unit. And, and of course, it's not realistic, but every hospital does need to be prepared. And, and so that's the, that's the big struggle that we're having now. You know, how do we find that, that, that right place for preparation in the United States um, without over-preparation? that not only is diverting our energies, but also diverting resources from where they really most are most needed in, in West Africa. L lastly, I just want to say, I think we need to also be very careful that we don't get the solutions to be so high tech that we price ourselves out of it and, and also just um, you know, make them, them so logistically difficult that we can't implement them where they're most needed. If we look in West Africa, our major problem is not environmental contamination. We don't have people that, uh, that have come and we say, well, we think they were infected from virus that has seeped into the groundwater and, and those sorts of things. So I think that um, you know, we really do need to focus on that person-to-person -person interaction is still where the money is and where we need to focus on. Thank you. Next question. Um, I feel a little bit of a split personality here. My name is Patty Olinger. I'm the Director for Environmental Health and Safety and um, providing support to the SCDU unit at Emory University um, and Biosafety. I'm also the co-chair for the um, ISO development of an international bio-risk management standard, which we're kicking off here in the next couple of weeks. I was on the SEN workshop agreement um, for bio-risk management development over the last 10 years. In addition, I am the global director for a nonprofit who does work in, in Africa and um, actually set up the uh, Nigeria, um, worked with Nigeria setting up their response to the Ebola team. Um, so I, you know, one of the concerns, first of all, as a bio-risk management geek, I will have to say seeing this panel up here is just phenomenal. It is um, very exciting to see um, the efforts and the enthusiasm looking at some of the science and technology that's going into it. Former life, I used to do pharmaceutical research, so I've seen a lot of this science and technology, which was alluded to, I believe, by Dr. Howard with regard to potent compound handling and everything. There's one group that's not at the table, and that is the USDA. If we look at our containment facilities for large animal research, um, you, you do see a lot of this type of technology with personal protective equipment working around large animals that are in containment. And that's a, that's a piece of the puzzle, and it's a you know, part of the team that needs to be brought to the table as well. Um, the Africa issue, um, and it's not just Africa, it's a lot of our developing countries. If we look at our developing countries, we have spent a tremendous amount of resources, billions and billions of dollars on security. And it's the global health security from a standpoint of containing, um, whether from a bioterrorist standpoint. But what we have failed is our global health security agenda is that on international health. And when we look at um, just these issues that we're dealing with, the dealing of looking at, our, do we have the capacity to, you know, identify, contain, respond to a potential outbreak, whether or not it's a, a terrorist attack or whether it's a natural born outbreak. And we really need to start looking at that. Um, you know, I commend um, those who are in the front lines. Um, as a biosafety professional, it is, you know, an honor to be able to provide help, you know, su support to you. Um, and in the, in whether it's here in the United States or not, but one of the concerns that I have as we're developing some of these technologies and everything is just what was voiced earlier, is how we then relate it to developing countries. Um, because they, it's not sustainable in those facilities. 
Um, the other area um, I would say is um, bio, from a bio-risk management standpoint is we need to do a better job of risk assessment. Um, you know, the guidelines that came out from CDC, you know, our healthcare facilities, what I'm finding is a lot of times they'll see those as law. And it's like, no, those were risk assessments. You know, I talked to the guys right across the street, you know, as they were developing them and everything. And these are, you know, we need to have, these are guidelines. We need to be able to teach our staff and our faculty and our students um, as, they're develop, as they're growing in their skill sets is how you do a risk assessment and how you equate that to the workplace. And how when all of a sudden when the uh, PPE line that you have depended upon dries up, what are you going to do next? And have those contingency plans in place. Um, and then um, there was also something that um, was interesting throughout our experiences was the non-hierarchy <laughs> of, um, and I don't remember which one of the panelists had indicated that, but that was a key component of the success of our SCDU unit, is that if a nurse said to a physician, stop, they had to stop. And that, in the beginning, was kind of one of those things that wasn't necessarily, you know, thought of very positively. But the success of our story was that anybody could stop a situation at any given time, anybody could question, and that the decisions whether or not we scaled up or scaled down in PPE um, was a team effort. And so I commend, I commend um, you know, this panel for what you're doing and looking forward. And then also I ask, you know, how are you going to start um, rolling this out uh, to not only healthcare facilities but our research because it, you know the lack of PPE is going to my concern is impact our research facilities here in the United States as well as abroad. Okay, so that was about six questions, but I'm going to put them uh, sum summarize uh, to the panel panel one at a time. And I think starting with that first point of of whether there's something to be learned from the practices that have been developed in the laboratories, uh, the the large animal laboratories and. I know, Dr. Peters, that you have been involved um, with outbreaks um, involving, I assume, primates or large animals. Um, and uh, there are, or some of you also have worked with animals, even though we don't have USDA at the table. So is there any comment um, on that particular issue? Well, we know that horses and goats are resistant to Ebola because the Russians have used them for prepare anisera. I think the expert here on setting up Diagnostics on the ground is Tom Kaisak. Humans are very large primates. <laughs> very true. <laughs> very, yeah, quite large. Not the largest, but certainly large, yeah. Okay, any other comment on that? Um, if not, um, I th thought also the, the issue about uh, use of, of risk assessment as opposed to protocols, and if there are more, if there may, may be more adaptive ways of doing preparedness and uh, developing um, responses in, in medical um, facilities as opposed to uh, simply following guidelines. I think that that was uh, the question. Dr. Hodgson and I are discussing who's going to take the risk assessment question. <laughs> Certainly, you know, it is a fundamental activity in occupational safety and health to assess the risk. And oftentimes, a lot of our uh, clinical infectious disease colleagues aren't quite as familiar, but uh, it is a fundamental principle. And it does, I think, have an important role to play here when we're talking about equipment needs, uh, because you may be uh, creating an inefficient situation if you're not assessing the risk uh, properly. And I think, you know, your comment about the health security, I just wanted to add to punctuate that. As I said in the beginning, I think this workshop uh, is about Ebola, but the larger issues we're talking about, and I, and I certainly hope the IOM and the NRC take this up, we're really talking about international health security. There are lots of different hemorrhagic viruses. Dr. Peters talked about one in Bolivia. There's Marburg virus. There's last. There's a lot of very serious uh, issues out there with internationalization of travel and business, et cetera. We'll be facing another workshop shop, but it's going to have a different name. It won't be Ebola, it'll be some other uh, infectious disease. So I think it's really important that we continue uh, these discussions. Yes. Um, just a little more detail. Risk communication, risk analysis, I mean, identifying the hazard and the degree of the hazard, using humans as a surrogate, at what temperature, at what subjective feeling of illness do we think people actually start shedding the virus? 
You know, is it 99.4, 100.4, 101.4? So those are some fundamental questions where we don't know the answer yet, and we actually are giving guidance. So hazard assessment, risk analysis. At which point do we know what kind of PPE to use? We could study that in a formal way. Unless the people who are going to have to act on that are involved in thinking through the questions and the guidance, they're not going to be comfortable with the answers. So involving healthcare workers in the process strikes me as important. Thank you. So the last one I'm going to pick off of that comment has to do with what um, one of the presenters um, called a non-hierarchical team-based approaches. And I know this has been a major concern of the Institute of Medicine for quite some time in the provision of higher quality healthcare delivery, uh, the, the need to have uh, changes in how members of healthcare teams interact around safety, around patient safety, as well as, well as around their own uh, personal safety. And I, if there are further uh, comments from the panel on that. Well, the overlap of employee and patient safety has been in the air since, I think, the first joint conference of NIOSH the Veterans Health Administration, ARC, and OSHA in 1998, at which Paul O'Neill did the keynote address and talked about that. And as we get to Ebola, where the source and the recipient are the same, you know, for many um, diseases, it's not as much of an issue. But clearly, this is the poster child for the overlap of patient and employee safety. And seeing the pictures in, um, in Liberia of those beds in tents was humbling as we think about the luxury of how we deal with patient safety here. Um, clearly, a huge, huge issue. Next question. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. Mike Ostrom, University of Minnesota. Um, I think if uh, you did a poll of everybody in this room, they'd probably agree that 15 to 20 weeks ago, none of us could believe we'd be here at a meeting like this talking about a situation like this. And in some ways, this lack of creative imagination of where we maybe could have and should have, but we'll all go back and wonder why we didn't think about this possibility, um, raises, I think, a very important question about where we move forward with this. You know, when you, when you look at the history of Ebola in the human species, you know, there have been 24 documented transmission situations, 20 community-wide outbreaks, 2,400 cases. The most number of generations with Ebola Zaire has been roughly five to seven, and Kikwik, 17 potentially, was Sudan. In many ways, this virus has hardly pinged the human species before now, and yet we've made general observations that we're extrapolating to this situation. You know, some of us have written about the fact that the virus hadn't changed, Africa had changed, and it was all about urbanization and crowding and lack of health infrastructure and poor response time. You know, one of the things I think we're really missing on right now is asking ourselves that really hard question again, like we could have asked ourselves weeks ago. You know, is there any difference in this potential virus? Uh, whether it's uh, an example of just a higher level of viremia, for example, or genotypically and phenotypically, we have such limited data to no data, that would that begin to change some of the possible conclusions we've had about past outbreaks. You know, we've had, had that for other infectious diseases where we know when we have higher levels of, of viremia or bacteremia with certain other infections, we can see the same principles of epidemiologic transmission, but the rate of transmission is different. The dynamics is, is, is different in that regard. And I guess it would be interesting here for this meeting because it's clearly we're making assumptions about all the previous outbreaks being the model for this outbreak, and surely in the general trends of epidemiologic transmission it is. But the question is, could it have changed? And, and it's not just the fact that it's crowding, that it's lack of medical services, et cetera, that this is, for example, uh, the higher viral loads that would result in different levels of transmission we've seen in past outbreaks. And I know Gary Kobinger will be covering some of this this afternoon. But I guess I would ask the panel the implications for that, because are we making a mistake here by expecting this to be exactly like the past outbreaks, just with more people? Any, um, anybody want to tackle that one? Daniel? I can come in, I guess. Uh, certainly valid questions. Um, I, my gut feeling is that the, the seeds of this are more related to the social and 
cultural factors um, and logistics of West Africa and people going back and forth and all that, but I think we, we definitely need to be open to scientific inquiry. And we, we have some of the beginning data. It just takes a long time to generate it, longer than we'd like. So we have some sequence data, of course, but that's not, that doesn't really tell us what we need to know. We need to put that into cell culture. We need to put that into non-human primates. We need to see if they have different um, manifestations, different uh, different viral loads. And so I think those studies, I can't you know, quote researchers, but I think that those things are probably being done in various laboratories um, in the United States and elsewhere. We just, it takes time to kind of get those. And then, of course, it takes time to, to generate all those data. If you think about just getting the samples and all the logistics of import permits and getting to somewhere where you can do those sorts of pathotypy type uh, experiments, um, it, it's just a, a slower process than it, when we'd like it to be, but it, it's a, a valid question that we need to be attuned to. Dr. Peters. Oh. Okay. I, mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if we didn't get an answer in the U.S. because in Africa, you're so pressured for time. There's so many people, so many different ways you can get Ebola, but you plop somebody down in the middle of Des Moines and you may find out whether there's aerosol transmission that has evolved over a period of time. Thank you. Thank you. Two at the mic, and I think we have just enough time to take these last two questions. So, so next question. My name is Robert Kim Farley. I'm Director of Communicable Disease Control and Prevention for the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health. Also chair of the Infectious Disease Prevention Control Committee of the National Association of County and City Health Officials. Mean, I just was, again, responding to uh, Dr. Besh, the realities and the needs on the ground in West Africa. Perhaps a domestic research area that we could also put some priority to is ways that we could more systematically improve the recruitment uh, as well as mobilization of health care workers, both public health and clinical, to help in West Africa. Thank you. Okay. Uh, agreed and, and, and open to any ideas you have to try to, uh, to increase the numbers. Right, last question. I'm Bob Harrison, California Department of Public Health. Um, after uh, the H1N1 pandemic, uh, we did a series of studies with uh, colleagues from NIOSH and several of the states, and we actually went into um, uh, about 15 hospitals in California, and I think nationwide we have about 60 um, in several of the states, and we asked how frontline healthcare workers perceive the use of PPE. Uh, we did some observation of donning and doffing, um, and we interviewed a whole series of staff in the hospitals, and uh, I think we learned a great deal about the implementation uh, of PPE on the ground, and I would put a plug in for putting that as a topic for research um, in terms of Ebola, not necessarily now. I think that would be a hard lift to do it next week when our hospitals just are in the midst of figuring out how to even purchase appropriate PPE. But sometime relatively soon, while the memories are still fresh, uh, because um, I get, we get a lot of questions at the state level about um, what exactly to buy. And I wish, I would really like to know how people are using it and what the experience of the frontline healthcare workers are. So I guess this model of more participatory research to help our public health at the local and state and federal levels really understand uh, uh, what we can, can learn um, six months or a year from now. Great. Thank you. I guess I'll, t I'll take this one. Uh, the, the, uh, over the last two or three weeks, I, I've, um, WHO has had a um, guidelines committee on PPE that, I, that I've chaired, and the guidelines just came out, I think, the day before yesterday, so you could find those. They are, I think, helpful. Um, we did do some surveillance of, from, of healthcare workers coming back from, uh, from West Africa and what they liked and disliked in order to, to inform those guidelines. We're, they, I think they're, they're valuable, but they suffer from what we desperately need, and while we're here, we need some evidence base. And so we came down to one person saying, you know, I think you need this, and another person saying, I think you need that. People could express what they liked, but when we said this is what's really necessary, it was all opinion. Okay, we're going to just take a last, last question. Mm. Um, one, one small remark, uh, Vincent Munster, Rocky Mountain Labs, Nyat. Um, and I don't know if everybody knows, but because Ebola is a select agent, uh, DSAT regulates experiments 
on this virus. And basically, these regulations hamper me in effectively respond fast to some of the research questions addressed here. And I think I want to put it out there that if I want to start doing something new, it will take me two years. Could you identify yourself again? Because I didn't uh, hear something. Vincent Munster, Rocky Mountain Labs, NIAT. Rocky Mountain Labs. <coughs> Comment on that? Um, it's probably true uh, that the, there are a lot of regulations that govern the ability to even initiate um, research in this area and something to be aware of. Okay, so we're going to shift now to our breakout groups, and I just first wanted you each to take a look at your badge, because on the back of your badge, it tells you what your breakout rooms are, so you know where you're going next. So that's nice, always good to know. And what we're going to do when, in these breakout sessions is that we're going to have expert speakers who are going to give a very, very short um, overview of the particular area. There will be a two-hour facilitated discussion of research areas. I, I believe that most of the breakout groups, if not all of them, will end up after the short presentation splitting into two just for the ability to facilitate a discussion so that each and every one of you can participate in the discussion. If you can stay with your group, that would be helpful just from the standpoint of that we, we're trying to balance the numbers for these groups so that it is possible for everybody to participate. Um, what, um, what will happen is that uh, there will be a rapporteur who's already been signed um, who will take notes. Um, there is a, a facilitator, the, um, the IOM, the National Academies, that will have staff with each one of these groups. And hopefully, after a full discussion and, and all of the ideas that you have in the room being put on the table, it will be possible for this, these groups to kind of informally prioritize into four or six important research uh, questions. And in fact, you will be given the opportunity to kind of um, multi-vote with little colored dots. I should say that that vote isn't uh, it isn't a recommendation from this um, meeting. It's just to help um, to give a sense of the priority of the groups that were brought together. At about um, 3 o'clock, we're going to move back into the auditorium for a plenary session. At that point in time, the facilitators and the rapporteurs for the breakout groups will be preparing the reports back. But, the, but all of you would be invited to come back to have a, a broad discussion. Um, the question that we will be addressing is what important Ebola issues remain to be addressed that were outside the scope of the workshop discussion. So we have four workshop areas, but if you can think of, of things that need to be addressed that are outside of those areas and would like to bring those to the fore so that people from the federal agencies who are involved here can hear them, so that the Institute of Medicine and the National Academies can hear them, this is an opportunity to bring Strong those kinds of issues before us. And then at about 3.45, the breakout facilitators and rapporteurs will come back and report from the sessions, and we'll have some time to discuss that. So that's kind of an outline of what the day looks like. And um, so I think that the thing to do now, again, is to look at the back of your name badge. And yes, there will be lunch. And do you want to tell us about how, how we will get our lunch? So. Good morning, and first of all, thank you everybody for your attendance. I'm Bruce Altsvo, a staff officer on this project. Lunch is going to be served directly outside in the Great Hall where you registered. Um, it is $15 cash lunch for those of you who we are supporting the travel, the speakers, the planning committee. In the back of your name tag, there is a little blue ticket that you can uh, pull out, and that will cover your lunch. Um, but we will ask for you to please quickly get to your breakout rooms that are listed up here so that we can convene and get going quickly. Um, also, for everybody on the web, do remind you that we are monitoring the website, um, monitoring the email address and the Twitter feed. So if you have specific questions that you'd like to submit to the group, um, specific research ideas, we, we welcome your participation in that manner. Yeah, and if you are doing that from the web, um, please identify which breakout group you would like um, to, to um, hear, hear your idea. And so the idea is we grab lunch on the way out and before we get to the rooms. And there's also a little map out there 
that um, indicates where these different rooms are located. So we'll see you in the discussions.